Welcome to part two of our long form analysis on video game difficulty. Recall that in part one, we explored how mechanical difficulty, which comes in two flavors, is intertwined with player and world physics, controller input, and animations. The right amount of difficulty is key to producing player flow, so it pays to balance your game meticulously. We've now covered our first major category, mechanical difficulty. The other fork, conceptual difficulty, is certainly more subjective. Conceptual difficulty isn't related to controller inputs or character animations, which can sometimes make it harder for the player to know whether a game is punishing them. This variety of difficulty often pops up when you're thinking hard about your progression in a game. You might be analyzing an enemy's movement patterns, devising a flanking strategy on a battlefield, or simply juggling obstacles while waiting for a moment to press your advantage. A roguelike with turn-based tile movement is a great example of conceptual difficulty. It's not your player's physics that must be mastered, but rather your own assessments and improvisation in unique situations. In other words, mechanical difficulty involves your hands and reflexes, but conceptual difficulty involves your brain and logic skills. Like mechanical difficulty, conceptual difficulty can also be applied either intentionally or unintentionally. But because feedback on conceptual difficulty is not always immediate like mechanical difficulty is, it can be harder for players to develop skill. Conceptual difficulty often takes the form of resource management, especially in turn-based or strategy games. A basic principle of economics called opportunity cost often lends precision to game difficulty. Opportunity cost essentially means that if you are presented with two or more options, but can only have one, then the options you didn't choose are lost as potential assets. For example, you might emphasize character defense over skill damage, in which case your character isn't as strong as possible, but you might survive longer. Making a deck consisting of just 30 cards in Hearthstone, which currently has over 600 different cards available, means giving up the benefits of many other cards you won't have room for. Conceptual difficulty is also commonly used as a barrier for secrets and bonus content that the average player may not even discover. It may be due to what is sometimes called game world logic, which will necessarily deviate from reality's logic. Beat Dark Souls 2 without saving or dying and you'll unlock a new ring, and because this makes no sense in reality, it ends up being a secret of the game's world acting on the game's logic. Denial of information regarding a game world is an easy way to reward the most dedicated players, but you run the risk of alienating everyone else. Developers can therefore choose whether to drop hints to the player to adjust the chances that a player will discover such secrets. Before we take a step down this road, I want to remind you that these are merely examples of difficulty modification, not critiques of the games, franchises, or companies themselves. In fact, we're going to start with three of my all-time favorites. Final Fantasy IX's Excalibur II weapon and Final Fantasy XII's Zodiac Spear are perhaps the most egregious examples in modifying difficulty via game logic. In particular, this kind of modification is the denial of information we mentioned above, and in these cases it's taken to its extreme. For Final Fantasy IX, you had to rush through the game and reach the final dungeon within 12 hours of playtime. The biggest offense here is that there's not a shred of information in the game that hints at this, so on a first playthrough, Roughly 99.99% .99 of all players will miss the chance to get this weapon. But this is a game that nearly demands taking the scenic route. It rewards careful planning as you teach your character certain abilities. It encourages inspecting equipment to find the best combination for each of your fighters, and pacing yourself throughout the game with a ton of optional content and side quests. In short, the game's values clash directly with the steps required to obtain the ultimate weapon. You know, this sounds like the perfect kind of secret for a strategy guide. Maybe we should get Brady Games to write a companion book. In fact, the more obscure the secrets are, the more likely our fans will buy a strategy guide to go with our game. Hey, Final Fantasy XII, I have a great idea for one of your weapons. Now, hold on a sec. Let's look at Final Fantasy X here. Let's see. We can require the player to complete a chocobo race with a score of less than zero seconds in order to get the main character's ultimate weapon. If the player can dodge, let's say, 200 lightning bolts in a row, we'll give them the Black Mage ultimate weapon. And we better not give any hints uh, or imply in any way that the player should attempt these. What do you think the odds are of a player figuring either of these out on their own? What, 0% you say? Perfect. Call up Brady Games, will ya? <laughs> Final Fantasy XII has hundreds and hundreds of treasure chests strewn throughout its levels. And there are exactly four that you must never, under any circumstances, open. The reward for not opening these four specific treasure chests? Arguably the most powerful weapon in the game, the Zodiac Spear. The problem here is information withholding. The four evil chests are in four completely different areas of the game, and one is even hiding among 15 other identical chests on a sandy shore. So which four chests should we forbid the player to open if they want to get this incredibly rare item? 
Are we going to drop hints in the game, or explain how the player's natural instinct to open treasure chest will sabotage a separate treasure chest that's miles or hours away? Maybe it's quantum entanglement, I don't know. But I have a better idea. Let's not mention it anywhere in the game, never explain that it's these four chests specifically, and let only the most determined players find it. Oh, and do me a favor. Call up Brady Games, will ya? Okay, we get the idea now. But the offenses here straddle the fine line between encouraging exploration and overwhelming the player and sending them to the internet for help. If the anxiety of missing out on game secrets is too high because of a high degree of information denial, then looking up a walkthrough on GameFAQs provides a superior experience. Luckily, these examples are for ultimate weapons, so it's perfectly possible, and indeed expected, that most players will complete these games without obtaining all of them without outside help. But this doesn't change the fact that these are examples of denial of information, artificially modifying a game's natural challenge to include factors that are essentially impossible for a player to know about. But if that same player picks up the strategy guide, they're getting real value out of learning the game's secrets. If any developer can make its game's secrets this obtuse in order to sell copies of an official strategy guide, we're looking at intentional conceptual difficulty. But since it's just as easy and also free to use an online walkthrough, we're going to have trouble selling the strategy guide. And if this book doesn't sell well, well, what's the point of making these esoteric secrets anyway? Denial of information on the same scale as those above is never rewarding because it has to be told, not shown, to the player. Would you spend two hours racing chocobos in Final Fantasy X if there were no reward? Would you spend an entire day dodging lightning bolts just for the sheer challenge? The hard copy strategy guide market has mostly fallen by the wayside, and whether that's a good or bad thing is up to you. I remember quite fondly flipping through beautifully detailed concept art while reading up on how to become better in certain dungeons or battles. And as long as a game is not designed with a companion guide in mind during development, this type of intended conceptual difficulty is typically a great additional layer of complexity to a game's world. Mist for PC was once the best-selling PC game of all time, but it didn't feature flashy action sequences or non-linear storytelling. Instead, like many point-and-click adventures, it relied on intentional conceptual difficulty. The game is challenging not because it requires fast reflexes, but because it requires careful, logical, and sometimes illogical, thinking. Point-and-clicks have used this technique for decades, and here we'll borrow TV Tropes terminology and call this moon logic. This is more or less when a game expects you to create a Rube Goldberg type contraption, using items in your inventory, and often the right answer is found by brute forcing, rather than logical thinking. For example, you're stuck in a jail cell and you have to escape. So let's combine a bottle of water with a deck of cards to make card mush, which is of course flammable when dry. We have to dry the card mush by combining it with a handheld vacuum, because we want to suck all the moisture out of it. Finally, we need to start a fire by, hmm, taking an origami crane and placing it through the jail cell bars. A guard will come by to pick it up and will fail to notice that he's dropped his lighter. Now you can light the card mush on fire to blast open the cell's door and escape. I've never played Grim Fandango, but there is a slight variation on intended conceptual difficulty in the following example. You're stopped from progressing by a bouncer, and you must prove that you know a certain mob boss by answering a series of number-based questions about him. You know none of these things, but you will inexplicably succeed if you answer with the number that just won on the roulette table behind you. This is clearly intentional, but the level of conceptual difficulty here is astronomically high, almost comically so. Can you imagine the frustration a player might feel six or seven hours into a great point-and-click adventure, only to be stopped by a seemingly inconsequential puzzle with no hints available? No matter the genre of the game, inspiring a player to seek out a walkthrough online so that they can better understand your mechanics is a good sign of your game's depth. Forcing your player to consult a walkthrough online because a person of average intelligence wouldn't connect unrelated dots is a bad sign that you're relying on artificial difficulty. Conceptual difficulty makes up essentially 100% of the Professor Layton series, as well as most free-paced puzzle games. You're still using the game's mechanical operation as a framework for puzzles, but the challenge isn't tied to the way the characters are animated or the height of your jump. Tetris and Dr. Mario do have a mechanical component, the time limit for each falling block but each puzzle in Professor Layton is an independent, wholly conceptual event. A game that breaks the fourth wall necessarily invalidates part of its own game logic, like fighting Psycho Mantis in Metal Gear Solid. Switching your controller to the console's second port is a clever and memorable trick, but almost nobody would think to do it in the heat of a boss battle. In fact, the game literally has to tell you that this is the correct solution, because it's so unintuitive. In other words, this is an intentional, incremental, conceptual difficulty, so detrimental to player flow that the developers solve it for you. What we're left with is a really, really neat trick and a short-lived difficulty spike. Unintentional conceptual difficulty is by far the most elusive type of difficulty, 
My go-to example is when there's a miscommunication between developer and player, disrupting game flow by some unexpected circumstance. We saw that intentional conceptual difficulty can sometimes resort to breaking the logic of the game world, and unintentional conceptual difficulty frequently happens in the same places if mechanics aren't easily grasped, or when negative player feedback is greater than anticipated. Before we dive back into it, we can take another quick example from Professor Layton here. Whenever you encounter a puzzle, you're taken to a puzzle screen separate from the game's environment, which informs the player that this puzzle is a self-contained event. Watch how this expectation is subverted. In one puzzle, you need to use two corks to plug up two bottles filled with garlic. You can stare at this maze of tubes all day long and never come up with a satisfactory answer. When you finally get frustrated at this puzzle, you might turn off the game, take a break, or give up entirely. But if you're lucky and tenacious, you might discover that the real solution to this puzzle is to use the corks to plug this man's nose. Does that feel like a cheap solution to you? It certainly does to me. There's a little bit of information denial at work here, subverting player expectations. If there are 300 puzzles and all but two or three actually respect the puzzle's conceptual boundaries, then those two or three violations will rarely feel satisfying. You might concede that, yes, I suppose the solution is quite logical, but it's not satisfying to come up against a puzzle like this only to feel cheated when the puzzle itself is merely a distraction. Exploiting game world logic with sleight of hand is a surefire way to disrupt game flow. Now we'll talk about game systems that can aggravate unintentional conceptual difficulty. Final Fantasy VIII uses a unique junction system for its magic. You no longer learn spells based on a class, and your casts are limited to the units of a particular magic spell that you have in your inventory. When I first played the game, I didn't understand the complexities of this system until many hours into the game, and the finer details still elude me. The danger here lies in the player potentially deciding that learning this system isn't worth his time, and instead, he'll go through the entire game without it, or put the game down entirely. One might be tempted to call this intentional mechanical difficulty, but because the junction system isn't tailored to providing a specific level of challenge, I'm not sure that it qualifies. Rather, junctioning requires the player to think and consider how they want their battle party to be equipped. It's never a developer's intention to provide a game system so complex that the player is turned off by it, but I think this junction system has the potential to unintentionally discourage players from engaging in the game. Regardless of the player's experience with RPGs, many are likely to be confused about how junctioning works the first time because there's no other system like it. But a minor tweak to the magic system, like in most other RPGs, still provides an anchor for players, so they only need to take a small mental leap to fully understand those magic systems. Conceptually, junctioning can unintentionally degrade the player's experience. Again, it's not the performance of the system itself that causes difficulty, but rather understanding it conceptually. Now, I'm probably in the minority for not understanding junctioning, but I'm pretty sure that every gamer out there can relate. So what might be the effect of this junction system on player flow? The game is balanced around the expectation that a player will use the junction system to the best of his or her ability. When the player loses this advantage, the game difficulty begins to outweigh the player's skill. It's interesting that, to fully enjoy this game, the player must first acquire a new skill, junctioning magic, which makes the beginning of the game potentially more difficult for players unfamiliar with the system. Silent Hill is a series well known for both its atmosphere and gameplay. The series also employs highly challenging puzzles, some of which require knowledge of outside information. Note how this is different than denial of information, in that it's information outside the game world that's missing, not rules and logic about the game itself. One puzzle in Silent Hill 3 requires the player to have knowledge of several different Shakespeare works. For example, the game gives the hint, one vengeful man spilled blood for two. And the correct response to this clue requires knowing that this describes Hamlet, and since Hamlet belongs to Anthology 4 in the game, this value has to be multiplied by 2 to get 8. Granted, this is the puzzle on hard mode. Normal and easy provide significantly less challenge here. But remember that we're focusing on unintentional conceptual difficulty. It is impossible for the developers to quantify the Shakespeare knowledge of consumers, especially in a different market region. This makes the puzzle a shot in the dark as far as what percentage of people will correctly solve it. The translation from Japanese to English fundamentally changes the meaning of the puzzle's hints. So, whatever the intended challenge of the puzzle was in Japan, it's most likely skewed upward or downward in North America. You might consider this to be intentional conceptual difficulty, and that's not wrong. I consider it both intentional and unintentional, because the original challenge of this puzzle is modified based on cultural differences and language barriers. The pieces of the puzzle remain the same, but the information given to the player is necessarily different. In fact, any translation from Japanese can affect the success rate of the player and sometimes vital clues are actually lost in translation. 
The original Legend of Zelda for the NES is infamous for its often baffling translations. In the Japanese version, one NPC tells you, search for the Lion Key. This gives the player a lot of information. It gives them a clear goal, finding the key, it tells them that the key will allow them to open up another part of the game, and they know that the key itself is probably somewhere in a dungeon or on the overworld. But the US version of this NPC has a completely different line, 10th enemy has the bomb. This doesn't tell us much of anything, which is why it's generally useless advice for most players. The use of the definite article the here hints at some greater importance than the indefinite a, and this hint fails to mention that you must kill 10 enemies in a row without taking damage. And of course, the player has no clue about the existence of any lion key. Another misleading translation occurs with this enemy, when you're given the hint that it hates loud noises. This hint is for Japanese players only, to use the built-in microphone on the second Famicom controller, which instantly destroys all on-screen enemies of this type. But since no such microphone controller existed in Western markets, this hint only served to unintentionally confuse players. The game is therefore more difficult for the average Western player because they have access to fewer tools to achieve the same tasks, namely killing this enemy. Luckily, this is a pretty inconsequential enemy, but the same sort of mistranslation for a more important enemy or plot detail could have been exponentially worse. Muscle memory itself can be considered unintentional conceptual difficulty. A player who has learned that B is run and A is jump would have significantly more difficulty with a game that switches this up than a player who never had this information burned into his muscles in the first place. A psychologist would refer to this as negative transfer, because learning is hindered by one's previous knowledge, like when you try to switch from a manual transmission to an automatic. While most games tend to adopt standard controller configurations, reversing the function of the circle and X buttons on a PlayStation controller could cause a lot of frustration during gameplay. A developer can't control the player's past experiences, so it's nearly impossible to put all consumers on a level playing field. Someone who recently switched from an SNES to an Xbox One would have a really tough time with on-screen directions. The extra second it takes to look down at the controller to verify can cause failure where others may succeed. When possible, giving the player his choice of challenge level is a perfectly adequate solution for conceptual difficulty. The Silent Hill series is fairly unusual in that it lets you choose difficulties for combat and puzzles separately, so that a player skilled in combat won't hit a roadblock on a hard puzzle and quit playing the game. System Shock also featured difficulty settings for four different aspects of the core gameplay. And Bravely Default for the 3DS lets you choose both the battle frequency and rewards. These options allow the player to experience the story at a pace not dependent on combat skills. All the changes we've mentioned here are indicative of the growth of video games as a narrative medium. As video gaming becomes more and more commonplace within society, it pays for developers to consider that some players want to experience a game's story without the potential frustration of gameplay. The connection between a player's skill and a player's success in a game's narrative has become more and more tenuous as games grow in technical complexity. All of this is to say that there's really only one goal in mind when adjusting difficulty, keeping the player in flow, and by extension, keeping an even pace between the level of challenge and player skill. When we talk about a game's difficulty curve, what we're really talking about here is the game's ability to induce flow over time. An easy game tends to produce too little challenge relative to skill, and a very hard game produces too much challenge relative to skill. But let's look at the big picture here and try to apply the concept of flow over the course of an entire game. All forms of media can adopt certain structures to help tell a story, and gaming is no exception. The last research paper you wrote in school probably needed an introduction, body, and conclusion. Where a film might use a three-act structure with rising and falling action, a video game structure might resemble a step function. As the challenge, the independent variable, increases over time, the player's skill level must increase accordingly, or else the player can't advance. This is probably a large part of what makes games so fun to play you very quickly gain mastery over new skills, and you can continue to refine them. This balance between challenge and skill usually goes by the name of flow, which makes video games unlike most other forms of media. As long as you're inducing flow, you're probably on the right track to making a satisfying game. Flow is the structure of video games. It functions independently of plot or gameplay. If you've ever heard someone refer to a game as more than the sum of its parts, there's probably well-managed flow making up the difference. So if our four types of difficulty make up the difficulty curve, and the difficulty curve in turn regulates flow, then the most elemental forms of difficulty produce nearly all of the satisfaction derived during gameplay. Mismanagement of flow causes predictable results. What happens if your abilities outpace a game's challenge? The game is easy at best, and at worst, it's boring. If a game's challenge outweighs the player's skills, the game is at best too hard, and at worst, hair-tearingly or controller-smashingly frustrating.
Have you ever reached a brick wall point in a game that seems disproportionately difficult based on the game so far? Perhaps it's a required boss fight in a Metroidvania, or an RPG boss that is so hard at first glance that you were sure you were supposed to lose. Then the game goes back to the title screen and your jaw drops because you just realized how much time you need to sink in to progress any farther. The Metroid-style Castlevania games for Game Boy Advance and DS often featured only a very mild increase in difficulty between bosses, while the bosses themselves may have represented a steep increase on a difficulty curve. This easy level, hard boss trope is just one of many common approaches for flow management, and it's also prevalent in the Ease and Dark Souls games. What's more is that flow deviation can occur almost any time and varies highly from player to player. This is the logic in Mario Kart's rubber banding AI. It allows for players of all skill levels to experience the same level of difficulty. It's also the reasoning behind Resident Evil 4's enemy density adjustments, and Oblivion's enemies always leveling at the same rate as the player. In essence, these games are collecting feedback from you, the player, to try and deliver a suitable difficulty from a static template. You'll probably spend a lot of time and money during game development if you want to provide dynamic difficulty in your game. So whether it's worth it or not to you to pursue this strategy is not always clear. By now, I think we can agree that difficulty doesn't operate in a vacuum, and it frequently blends with overall balance by affecting most mechanics on a foundational level. As the capstone to this discussion, let's analyze two existing titles for difficulty implementation and see if we can identify what types of challenge we're dealing with. Doom 2 is still one of my favorite games because of its fantastic level designs and skillful combat, and it features five different difficulty settings. Rather than telling the player explicitly what's changed between each difficulty setting, the game intentionally obscures this information in its iconic difficulty descriptions. In addition, all the stuff inside each level is affected by this setting, so keys needed to complete each level may have different locations, affecting conceptual difficulty if the key becomes harder to find. Both enemy numbers and behavior have three unique settings, and the highest difficulty adds respawning monsters with increased animation speeds. Each level has numerous secrets that often require a sharp eye for misplaced or unusual textures, and as levels grow in size over the course of the game, you'll often find that the conceptual difficulty spikes as you search out both keys and their respective colored doors. But the game's conceptual difficulty is sound. Get to the exit whether you've killed enemies or not. You're never unsure of what your goal is, merely how to achieve it. If I had to point to an unintentional conceptual difficulty in this case, I'm sometimes confused if I hit a switch, but don't notice any immediate change in my environment. I think that this is a way to hint to the player that the affected door or platform is far away from the switch, but I sometimes find myself questioning whether I hit the switch, and maybe I should go hunting for a change, or maybe I accidentally hit it twice and subsequently deactivated it. Some switches automatically turn off after a short delay, and without doing some research on the game's puzzles, the varying behavior of switches and buttons can be confusing to a new player. The many different approaches to challenge here are a good representation of difficulty snowballing. Notice that on the hardest difficulty, all these separate factors synergize with each other. If you have conditions X, Y, and Z, then the difficulty that's put out might not be directly proportional. It depends on how each factor behaves in the presence of all the others. Doom 2 mixes both major types of difficulty to provide a challenge that is more than the sum of its parts. I played FTL for the first time last year and was addicted to the game's challenge for quite a while. It bears no resemblance to Doom 2, but various difficulty methods will overlap between these two. We'll start with the mechanics. Just as shooting a rocket in Doom 2 subtracts one rocket from your available stockpile, making a single faster than light jump in FTL subtracts one from your fuel stockpile. Get your health or hull integrity down to zero and the game ends, but FTL has a much slower pace. You can pause the game at any time to assign a limited supply of power to different parts of your ship. All locations in FTL involve an event that's randomly generated from a large pool of possible scenarios, and since this means the game is never the same experience, it's substantially more difficult to survive without quick and critical thinking. Unlike Doom 2, FTL features the traditional easy, normal, hard system for difficulty, and the differences between the three are made explicit to the player. Despite the completely different style of gameplay, the changes are similar to Doom 2. Pickups are more plentiful on easy, enemies are harder to take down on hard. FTL features many more layers of mechanical complexity. You can choose from one of about 30 different ship layouts, each with a combination of 8 different playable races, the weapons you come across are randomly generated, and the chance to hit or evade is a huge factor in battle. So where Doom 2 uses essentially no randomness, FTL relies on it, and also piles on a few more layers of player choice. Have you ever played a game that made you simply stop and think for an extended period, perhaps when you had to choose one option out of several choices? I've literally stared at my screen for minutes, thinking about all the possible outcomes when I'm deciding which weapon to buy, which kinds of crew members to use, or which airlocks to keep closed. 
This goes back to our opportunity cost when making decisions, and FTL really shines with its conceptual difficulty. Every decision you make can come back to bite you later, or carry you through to victory. And it's impossible to tell how a single event will affect your playthrough because all events are random. You might lose half your crew and 75% of your hull integrity after three battles, but end up with a full party of eight and insanely powerful weapons five minutes later. Because you're never sure what's next, repeated playthroughs will slowly fill out your knowledge of what's possible. This, in turn, encourages careful thinking and resource management, with priorities that change over the course of the game. You can't power a section of your ship without sacrificing utility in another area, but you can spend some currency to get more power units. But if you do this, you might not be able to afford a weapon, if you happen to come across a shop in the next three or four jumps. There are a lot of ifs here, and I think that's part of this game's intentional conceptual difficulty. The player doesn't know the chances of any particular event happening at a location. If there's a 95% chance that a battle will occur at any location, you might decide to backtrack to a repair shop. But if there's only a 20% chance of battle, then you might want to risk it to get to a shop a little bit farther ahead. Given your limited fuel source, this makes every single decision a heavy one. You can always reload a save in Doom 2 and go for a Hail Mary, but in FTL there are no second chances. Now throw in all those other mechanics we've mentioned, and you've got a highly complex game whose difficulty is just as variable, regardless of the actual difficulty setting you've chosen. Because of its random nature, not every game is winnable, but each failed run teaches you something more about FTL's game logic, so that your next run is more likely to succeed. I hope it's apparent that these two games balance difficulty in similar ways, and equally apparent is how they still manage to emphasize two completely different player behaviors. Both games do more than just play the numbers game when you choose a difficulty setting, and the resulting cascade of changes fine-tunes whichever setting you choose. As always, the key is producing and maintaining flow, and if there's one thing that this comparison should tell you, it's that developers can mix any of the four major types of difficulty in whatever proportions will fit their vision. This tentative framework for difficulty is immature, and while it has so far accommodated every example of difficulty I've come across, it's not necessarily the best model. Our four major categories of difficulty all affect flow in their own unique way, and like difficulty, inducing flow is always a balancing act emerging from four distinct approaches to providing challenge. The problem with trying to objectively describe everything that goes into making a game challenging is akin to explaining all the parts of a car when they're in a pile on the ground. They just don't do much of anything. But when in the correct configuration, different units of difficulty add up to an emergent difficulty, mostly untethered to any one factor. Each difficulty factor in isolation has its own properties, but together all factors synergize unpredictably. I hope that this analysis has given you a little bit of insight in making game difficulty work for you. And if you're currently trying to balance your game's difficulty, feel free to adjust the relative strength of enemies, the relative strength of your player, the health of your player, the strength of items and power-ups, frequency of items or power-ups, the frequency of enemies or enemy types, the complexity of the enemy AI, the player's movement speed, jump strength, acceleration, gravity or density, the animation speeds, the time limit, the time scale, puzzle complexity, game world logic. Finally, if you're still with me after all that, a little bit of luck can't hurt.